The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Welcome to Compass. In this special episode, we will revisit a day of destruction and death in Tracy, Minnesota. June 13, 1968, 50 years ago, an F5 tornado devastated the community. Nine members of that town died that day, more than 150 severely injured. It all happened so suddenly with little notice. According to people who lived that day, the sky around the community was blue, except for menacing cloud approaching from the southwest. I'm joined in this retrospective look at Tracy by Scott Toma, who lived through that incredibly dangerous event. He's written a book which memorializes that tornadic event in Tracy and titled it Out of the Blue. How appropriate. Welcome, Scott. Now, during this Compass episode, we'll see the destruction through vintage photographs. Scott will set the stage for how the events of that fateful day came to be, how the community responded, and how neighboring towns helped Tracy to recover. So, Scott, let's set the stage. What kind of day had Tracy experienced up until about 7.03 p.m. when the tornado struck the community school and the clock stood still? We, we used to go every single day down to Central Park. It was a big park in the middle of town. It was a whole group of us. Every day in the summer, we would ride our bikes down there and play ball all day. We would bring a brown paper sack of lunch, and we would play until they'd come yelling for us to come home. And we would ride our old banana seat bikes down there. It's about three, four, five blocks, depending on where you live. Like I said, we would go down there and play all day long. This day, about 11 o'clock in the morning, we all rode down there, and... When we would get up to the park, we would just let our bikes go and fall where they may so we could go start playing right away. This day, we all dropped and laid in the grass. It was so hot and humid. It was about 100 degrees, high humidity. You know, like I said, when you're that young, the humidity doesn't bother you that bad. But we just laid in the grass. It was like just exhausted. We ate our lunch and went home. But the, the, it was so quiet around town throughout the day. Nobody mowing their lawn, nobody trimming their hedges. Everybody was just sitting on their porch, fanning themselves. But you just didn't see anybody walking dogs, nothing. It was just like a real quiet, quiet day. And, of course, in that era, uh, not a lot of air conditioning, so people were trying to struggle with that heat and humidity. Right. So about noontime, you're deciding we're not going to play ball. And little did you know that seven hours later, all heck breaks loose in the city of Tracy. Right, and you don't have the, the advanced technology they do today with all the storm chasers. And, you know, they give you every so often where the storm is and everything. This developed, this supercell came from you know, Sioux Falls area. And they would warn you, you know, this possible severe weather is coming. But they didn't know like they could do today exactly where the tornadoes would be and stuff. So nobody, we needed rain bad. We were hoping for a storm. We were actually pleased when they said some bad weather was coming. It would bring rain. It would bring some rain, rain. and some, and cool the weather off a little bit mm -hmm. too. And yeah, so it, it, was, a, it was a really different day. Well, the, uh, the photo that we're looking at right now is an iconic photo of the tornado itself. Who took the photo and, and where was it taken? This photo was taken by a 16-year-old kid from Walnut Grove named Eric Lance. It became a very iconic photo. His dad and his uncle owned the Walnut Grove Tribune at that time. Walnut Grove, seven miles to the east of mm -hmm. Tracy. His uncle, Eric and his dad were eating supper, and his uncle came over and said, Tracy got hit by this terrible tornado, or is getting hit. 
had jumped in their car, drove the seven miles over to Tracy. By the time they got there, it had done its damage in town, but it was just leaving to the northeast. So Eric and his dad driving, Eric's got the camera. He used to help his dad at the newspaper mm -hmm. and take pictures and write some stories. And they chased it all the way outside of town, about three, three and a half miles outside of town. And he's the He's the last living person today that saw the, the end of the tornado. Right. Now, the tornado hits, well, we, we can show the photo here of the clock that stood still. This was in the school, correct? Right, it's a, the old analogic clock that right. hung on the wall of the school. 703. Stopped at 703. Some of the clocks, you know, were off a little bit. There was a few of different ones that they found, but that's when it hit the school knocked the power out in town, and, and it pretty well devastated the school. This photo was shown in newspapers across the country just to show when time stood still right. that day. So, so uh, what advance notice of any sort did you have in Tracy or in that area about potential for a tornado or an actual tornado sighted? Well, the potential for a tornado wasn't until, you know, it got a little bit close. Like later in that afternoon, the, web, the supercell had gotten you know, worse and worse. And we always would watch Sioux Falls TV or Mankato that, that back then. And the Sioux Falls station would say, you know, there's potential for a tornado watch. Um, we didn't get the actual tornado warning until, you know, later, real late in the afternoon. The actual tornado, when it touched the ground and became a tornado, was spotted about eight and a half miles southwest of town. Um, now, did sirens sound? Did you have a warning in town? Yeah, we got between eight and ten minute warning because of a, a farm couple called it in that it had been out there in the country. And the tornado was traveling 30 to 35 miles an hour. I know a lot of people think they travel faster, and that's about average. And they called it in. We got about eight to ten minute warning, so that helped a lot. All right. So the tornado strikes, and the devastation immediate because it comes swooping through. But we'll 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 talk about how seemingly odd a tornado is. One right. side of the street, nobody hit. The other side of the street, total destruction. Right. So we'll, we'll take a look here at a photo of the the, the school itself. The the community school, devastated. I mean, totally devastated. This is a three-story, built in 1898, uh, elementary school. It was in the planning stages to be torn down. Um, you know, in the next year, the year after, they were building a new high school out in the country at the time. We would move the elementary kids to the old high school, and then the high school kids would go to the new high school, and then they were going to build a new elementary school after that. So this this building was quite old, but held a lot of memories for a lot of people. Indeed. So, so as the tornado makes its progress, and we might note on that photo, the very point that I made a moment ago, across the street, uh, nothing touched. There's a garage. You wouldn't know a tornado had been near it. Right. And we saw, you can see the path going southwest to northeast in this photo. Um, there's a home on the one side that is damaged and then right next to it, it isn't. It hit the school and shifted to the west a little bit. And so then the, the homes originally in the path, if it had stayed the same way, they became unscathed then. So. Yeah. Well, again, tornadic behavior, who can predict? Right. So let's talk about what happened after 7.03 p.m. and all hell breaks loose. What was the response from emergency personnel? How did you handle it with the limited people you had in Tracy to undertake such a massive problem? Right away you'd hear sirens blowing. I mean, they did an outstanding job. The firemen all went to the fire trucks to help. And I mean, they just did an incredible job. It's not like they had practice or anything for this. You don't expect a little town like that to get hit. Um, so you'd hear sirens throughout the rest of that night. Um, the funeral directors in town, which also used their hearses as ambulances, would try to take them out. The, the gentleman, John Almley, owned a funeral store and a furniture store in town. He went to his 
uh, funeral home to get his hearse out, but it was blocked by all the trees had fallen on it and everything. Plus, he didn't think taking one person at a time would go quickly enough to bring all the injured to the hospital. There was 150 injured. So he runs down to his furniture store downtown. He gets his furniture truck, an old open-ended truck that he hauled his furniture in around town, and he, he started driving around town to pick up injured people, and they put him in the back of this old, basically a lumber wagon. And he said that, you know, the, the streets aren't cleaned up or anything, but he had to get to the hospital with these people, so it would just be like a hay wagon right out in the middle of a plowed field. It was that bumpy, and he, he would hear the people groaning in the back of this truck because they were every time he'd hit a bump and everything. But he got him to the hospital, and, and uh, the nine people that were killed in the tornado had all, they didn't die in the hospital, they had died at their home. None of those nine people were in a basement. So everyone in town that day that made it to the safety of their basement made it through this tornado. Tim. Now, you had other <clears throat> communities coming in to assist. What other towns and what did they do? Well, I could name, I'll leave somebody out if I named every town. When, when you would walk around the streets to look at the damage, there was trucks and emergency vehicles, rescue, pickup trucks from, you'd see on the side, every town there was around there from Marshall, Cottonwood, Pipestone, Walnut Grove. I mean, and like I said, I don't want to name all, they would, I'll leave them out. Every town you could possibly think of came down there to help. It was just the, the best thing to see all these towns immediately coming to help. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a look here at another photo that uh, shows the devastation in a, in a street that's been kind of cleaned out so you can get up and down it. But the trees on either side of the street are reminiscent of what we see in war photos. Right. World War I, World right. War II. That must have been what it felt like. Yeah, the, the leaves are just completely stripped off those trees. The streets were you know, piled high like they are on the sides there. They would bring the city workers getting their snow plows and some farmers came with tractors, they plowed the streets of the debris and everything, so the emergency and rescue vehicles could get down to hook up the power again or to get the injured and... So the tornado hits at 7.03 p.m. So in June, you've got a couple hours of daylight yep. at least. Then things go on through the night, I presume. Right, all through the night. You'd hear the, like I said, the sirens. You'd hear, you'd hear chainsaws even starting at night because sometimes they had to cut away to get to people out or somebody might be buried under there. They didn't know how many died right away because some people were gone. There's no cell phones back then. Right. They, if they weren't home, you didn't know if, you know, they didn't always tell somebody they were going out of town or anything. So they searched the entire dark all night long to look for people, so. Well, uh, again, uh, <clears throat> Thank goodness for community relations with our neighbors. Right. And it would take yeah. a massive amount of people to handle the immediate cleanup so you can get emergency vehicles to where you need them. Right. The other thing was the doctors and nurses from all these towns come over to assist at the hospital, but they needed even more. Is they needed at least people to stitch up until they could go into surgery. So they brought in veterinarians they brought in Dennis from the little towns around here. Anybody that knew how to stitch, so. How, how many days was the town in crisis, if you will? I mean, this, this, the cleanup is massive. That takes many, many weeks and months. Well, they had to shut the, the water off in town because uh, until everybody was accounted for, if they were buried in their basement, they would drown if the water was still you know, on. Right. Um, the power, the gas was shut off. So I would say, you know, a week maybe. Okay. You know, until, I mean, there was cleanup immediately and everything, but I would say a week until order was restored, you know, enough to where mm -hmm. you would feel comfortable getting around. The streets were cleaned up by then. And they did block the town off. This hit on a Thursday. They blocked the town off. The National Guards came in, you know, to prevent looting and just to, not so many people because they're still trying to rescue people and stuff. And then it, they released the barricades on a the Tuesday, and there was cars lined up on Highway 14 for 
miles on each side of people wanting to come in to see what had happened. Right. Gawkers. They, they gawkers. Would say. Right. Yes. Uh, another photo here, kind of kind of ironic, yeah. because it, it shows the devastation, particularly of a an emergency vehicle, with the old familiar civil defense sign on the side of the of the truck, battered to <laughs> probably no use whatsoever. Right. Yeah. But uh, that that is ironic, uh, and a vehicle intended to be used particularly for this Rescue. type of event. And it's useless. Right, just buried in the rubble. Yeah, they would. They weren't able to use that at all. It had flat tires in the back, but yeah, it's ironic that a rescue vehicle that they probably would have done some service in town that day went went useless. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to turn to another photo here because it helps to demonstrate the power of an F five tornado, and the, pho the photograph shows a a box car on its side, and fortunately there's a couple of survivors, a couple of ladies talking about the problem. The box car is located where from the railroad tracks? About two or two and a half blocks north of the railroad tracks. This is on Fifth and Morgan. If you go today, every time I go back home to Tracy, every time, even 50 years later, and I just did the other day again, I still drive to this intersection of Fifth and Morgan just to look south to see how far you can see the railroad tracks off in the distance. So how far from the tracks to this site? I would say landed? about two to two and a half blocks. 25 ton, it was an empty box here, 25 tons, blew, it didn't roll, it blew in the air, landed on this intersection. People come out of their basements and see this boxcar sitting right in the middle of the intersection, neatly placed right in the middle of the intersection. Uh, it, it, again, the power of tornadoes. Yeah. And, and uh, that's one way how they determined an F5, the, the weight of the boxcar, how far the wind blew, you know, how much wind speed would it take to blow that. An F5 tornado is... 260 to 318 miles an hour. They did determine ours was over 300 miles an hour, which is extremely, that's even on the very high end of an F5. And tornado. actually, as, as we've noted in Minnesota history, there have been really only three F5 tornadoes. Recorded. Uh, recorded. Yes. It's two solely with, contained within the state, this one in the Chandler Lake Wilson tornado. And then there was one up in the Fargo-Moorhead area that started in North Dakota and came across to mm -hmm. Moorhead. Now, another shot here that shows how ironic tornadoes are and how almost absolutely un, um, un, inexplainable they are. It, it's a photo of a house that got hit, obviously, on a portion of the house, but the, the main house stands, but a wall is off and it looks kind of like a doll house. We called that the doll. There was two in town like this. This was, this was such a good photo of this. The things inside the home did not get damaged. The toilet paper was still on the roll. The towels were still on the rack in the bathroom. And it, it, you know, I can smile about it now, but you know, when you're seeing it that day, it was, you know, it was sad, but it's kind of, it's almost humorous to see that, how it just stripped that whole wall up, but the things remained intact inside there. Everybody, this was a, this was like a museum piece that day. There was people standing, hundreds looking at that. They just couldn't believe that. It, anecdotally, did the house <coughs> remain repaired or did it come I, down? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. No. Okay. I just don't remember that. So, would, but I many would, houses devastated, wrecked, ruined. About 25% of the homes in town were damaged right. beyond repair. So. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it didn't end in uh, Tracy itself because the tornado went on either prior to Tracy or after, hit the rural area. And, and our photo here shows one of the farmsteads where the silo remained standing, yeah. um, but the rest of the farm gone. Pretty gone, yeah, that's kind of ironic that those stood the test of time here too. But the tornado started about eight and a half miles southwest of town. It went from one end to the other end of town about two miles and then another three and a half miles outside of town. I believe it was 13 and a half miles on the ground the entire way, it took 25 minutes. Um, but this is one of the, the farm sites that got, there was three or four farm sites that got devastated on each side of Tracy. 
But this, this also was taken by Eric Lance when he was running, chasing the tornado all over. He was the original storm chaser. He didn't even know it at that time. <laughs> you know, he and his dad are chasing the tornado all over. Now we have hundreds of thousands of storm chasers. So he claims he's the one that started doing all that. He wants to take some credit for that. Well, so. he might as well. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the photographic evidence is there. The, the pictures that he took of the tornado and everything are so good compared to the equipment he had back then. No digital cameras, none of those expensive long lenses. Right. He's, and his dad's driving the car chasing this and he's shooting out the window of the car. And I mean, some, you know, he would stop and take these pictures, but it, it was interesting, so. So let's talk about the recovery. Uh, Tracy's come back in a very nice community, but it was a devastating blow. And how long did things take to kind of come together to get this cleaned up and then start replacing? You know, it's up to a year before they get everything. You know, the insurance adjusters have to deal with that. They, they just did such a wonderful job. They, they really helped the people a lot in town. They knew what they were going through and they went above and beyond to help everyone. You know, the cleanup took a long time. The, the trees, it, it was stuff in the trees five, ten years later. But the day, you know, all these strip trees that we looked at in another photo, you would see rags all in there, mm -hmm. torn and stuck up in the trees, and they would be blowing in the wind like the town had survived, or, a, you know, like you were... Right. Um, victory flag. Yeah. Well, okay. I don't know if it was victory. <laughs> Surrender <laughs> flags yeah. at the time is Survival. what they looked like. Yeah. You know, the white T-shirts and stuff were blowing in there. When you looked at it, it looked like they were surrendering and stuff, so... Well, it's uh, just a wonderful walk down memory lane with, with a lot of pain, some agony, yeah. but now in retrospective, uh, it was a moment that will never be forgotten here, and we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and so let's talk about what's going to be happening in Tracy on which day and where will it be and what's going to happen. This will be the 50th anniversary of the tornado, so I don't like to say that because then people knew that I was around, so they kind of figure out how old I am. I don't want to tell them that. But. Trust me, you're a young man. <laughs> so, Saturday, June 9th, the Saturday before the actual date of June 13th, we're having a, a fundraising of sorts to... My original idea to do this was I wanted to honor these nine people that were killed in the tornado to, to keep their memory alive, so to speak. I tried to think of a way I could do that. Um, I just figured all these events that we're going to have, all the proceeds will go to the Tracy Area High School for scholarships in the names of these nine people that were killed. So hopefully we'll be able to raise enough to give nine different scholarships out in various amounts, whatever it'll be. Each student that gets a, is honored with a scholarship will get a framed um, of the picture of the person they're named for, a little story about that person that I'm getting from their families. Mm -hmm. So they can learn who that person is that their scholarship's named for. We're going to have a silent auction, live music, a bake sale, a quilt raffle, a medallion hunt. You're going to have guest speakers there. Um, we're going to release nine black balloons. As they read their names off, we're going to hit a big chime that, you know, like a gong. Um, and then we'll have, we're trying to get a family member to release the balloon. The one thing that I found kind of I ironic was I was looking for some family members of the people that had died. You know, a mm -hmm. lot, they're hard to locate now. A lady called me from Iowa and she said that I am the granddaughter of this Ella Haney that died in the tornado. Ella right. was 84 when she died in the tornado. Her granddaughter said, uh, you know, if you want some information, I have and I have her photo. And she said, I'm 84 years old today. Wow. Her grandma died at 84 and she was 84. So, so powerful story, yeah. June 9th in Tracy. From 10 uh, a.m. till about 3 p.m. Right. Well, our thanks to Scott Toma for sharing his experience and great writing skills to describe the devastation of the June 13, 1968 tragic F5 tornado in Tracy. Scott's book is Out of the Blue, and it is available online. Simply go to tomabooks.com, and you'll find not only the opportunity to buy the book, but 
some other materials to help you appreciate the devastation of this F5 tornado. It literally turned the Tracy community upside down. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Compass. You can attend a fundraising event, as Scott has outlined, on Saturday, June 9. The proceeds will be awarded to Tracy students' scholarships in memory of the nine people killed in that devastating tornado. Thank you for joining us on Compass and for your support of Pioneer Public TV. If you missed an episode of Compass, every episode is available to watch free online at video.pioneer.org or on the PBS video app. And keep up to date with the latest Compass happenings on our Facebook page. Search Compass on Pioneer on Facebook and hit the like button. Do you have an idea for Compass? Send your suggestions and comments to your TV at pioneer.org.